So I wanted to talk to you two together because, um, you know, you both work in kind of genre filmmaking, at least so far, you know, sort of, um, you know, horror, action, comedy, um, I guess, crime drama before that with, with Little Woods. And yeah, I feel like you're kind of smuggling big ideas into really popular, entertaining, fun movies. Is that, is that the plan? Is that the secret plan? Or, you know, is that just kind of how you think? I just really enjoy genre movies. You know, I, I want, I love John Carpenter, Paul Verhoeven, like those are the kinds of filmmakers I'm like, oh, I'd love to, to play with the, in the genre sandbox, but then bring characters I don't see, you know, see myself in there. You know, I, I grew up loving Jackie Chan movies and like Hong Kong Wushu, so I was like, oh, I'd love to make a, a sort of action movie with a, a brown girl in it. So it was... I think it's just who I am and it's the kind of films that I, I love and like if there is another meaning, if there's depth, cool, but if there's not, sweet. You know. <laughs> yeah, similarly, I really love genre films and growing up, you know, I really loved westerns and I really loved like psychological thrillers and I love horror films. Um, you know, making a a movie with Jordan Peele, like that's his whole thing, like his whole brand is like socially conscious, you know, horror and like elevated horror, which I think is kind of becoming a tired <laughs> term. Um, so that was just like within the DNA of what it was. But yeah, I like, I like when movies have something else to say. Like I love them just being fun. There is a, I like to have a, a level of intellectual rigor with any of the things that I do, but I, I also really want to entertain people. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you've just made the marvels. You've just, you're just right. finishing work. I mean, you're probably yeah. like, You've sneaked it's, out with the office. To right. Be yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. It's that was crazy. I mean, that's that's funny because it's basically well, when I got uh, when I first heard about it, it was like, oh, Captain Marvel two, and I was like, oh, yeah, she's not really my girl, maybe as much, but I'm totally I love Marvel, so like, let's see what else is happening. And then later they're like, it's Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel, who's my one of my favorite characters. I used to read her in the comics when it first came out and Monica Rambeau, and I'd worked with Tiana on Candyman, and I was like, well, well, well. And so I pitched on it, and thankfully got it, but um, I had this meeting with Kevin where he was like, well, actually, this is kind of a sequel to five things. And I was like, how did I end up in, with this horribly difficult job? <laughs> I was like, oh, dear God, help me. But yeah, it's, um, because it's a sequel to five things, the entertainment factor has to be so high. Um, so it's... It's a great job, but it's very stressful. Mm. You've got five sets of fans to keep happy, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like a little bit with Polite Society, just because people went nuts for We Are Lady Parts, your TV show. Have people seen Lady yeah. Part? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like there must have been a little bit of pressure coming, coming off the back of that as well. Nah. nah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not five Marvel characters, man. Um, no, Lady Parts was stressful because there was like, you know, the burden of like representation with like all these Muslims and stuff. So that was like stress. But after that, you know, after like it came out and people liked it, I was like, sweet, polite society. I kind of like felt a burden lifted. I felt free, actually, yeah. Helen. I was free. Now I'm full of burdens because I'm like, second film? I have no idea. <laughs> but that, that is kind of something I want to ask you about because I've, I've read a bunch of interviews with both of you over the last few weeks just preparing for this. <laughs> and, and something that came up in interviews with both of you was pressure to conform to stereotypes in your storytelling that you were just like not interested in. And like, first of all, ew, gross. Uh, second of all, like, how do, you, how do you kind of push back against that? How do you kind of stand up to that nonsense? Well, I, I think, you know, Polite Society took 10 years to make and the first kind of meetings I was having about it was like, can you make the family a white family that will make it more palatable? So it like, and then I was like, no, I can't. Or, and then, or it'd be like, you know, doesn't need to be, an, it doesn't make sense that it's an action movie. And I was like, why? Like, it should be like a sort of real social drama because it's got like brown people in it. I don't know, it was weird. Um, so it, early on it was hard and then I would just basically step away and think, okay, polite society is just never gonna get made. Um, and I really wanted to be a filmmaker, but film wasn't opening up for me, um, but television was. So I was starting to direct pilots, write for kids TV, and then I finally got to make the pilot of We Are Lady Parts. And it was cool because it was a pilot, so no one really cared. And there wasn't that much pressure, no one was really watching me. So you could kind of like do your own thing and then it did well. And then they're like, oh, oh, okay, go and do a series. So I kind of got in like the back doorway and then got really lucky. Like once Lady Parts was made, Tim Bevan at Working Title was like, do you have a film? I was like, oh, I do have a film. 
And I brought polite society. He's like, you're insane. He's like, you should make this more insane, which is the best note I've ever got. I've usually been like, take out the action, make it sad, make it white, you know, whereas he's like, make it crazy. So it was great. So I feel, I feel lucky that my career has meant I haven't had to, to, to deal with too much bullshit yet. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, so much bullshit on this end. Um, but I, I similarly feel lucky. Like, I, I would say Candyman's probably the most, like, um, didactic film as regards to race. And um, But that's also, again, like, in the DNA of, like, when you think Jordan Peele movie, like, that's what you're getting. And, and I loved Candyman. I loved Jordan's work. So even though I, like, for myself, always had this, like, sort of thing where I was like, I'm not really interested in, like, like violence against black people in films. Like I'm not really gonna tell stories like that, blah, blah, blah. And then it comes across my desk <laughs> is the opportunity to like riff on a movie that I loved as a kid, work with someone I really admire inside of a space that I was like not gonna, you know, for these very reasons. But then I kind of like, I have this whole thing that I think about as a filmmaker of color, as a female filmmaker, like what does real freedom look like? Is it doing everything in opposition to your expectations or is it just doing what you want? So. I was like, okay, I'll do it for this one. But other than that, like, you know, Little Woods, everyone was like, similarly, like, is this a black movie? But it's not really about black, what we think of as black stuff, but your lead is black, but like, you're in North Dakota, like, what's happening? It was an interesting sort of, the way people perceived the film was really interesting. But it was so cheap, they were like, whatever, girl, just do whatever you're doing. Um, and then the Marvel movie is just already what it is. It's just like, it's their story, their thing, and I'm just there to like, add my little, like, you know, paprika to it. I think our careers would be so different like 10 years ago. Like, cause you have so, you, there was just so much less vision and less um, urgency and less interest in us telling stories that weren't like the same old same about like educating people who didn't look like us or live like us about what our experiences were. And now it's kind of like, well, we can do polite society. Like, you know. I feel like there's, there's a weird thing that Hollywood executives and, and th those financiers and so on do, whereas they, they think that people want to see the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And they are, I, I don't know if you agree, leaving money on the table apart from anything else. Like people want to see everything in the world on screen. I have not seen a film like Polite Society before. I had not seen a sequel, remake, whatever we're calling it, to Candyman before, done like Candyman was done. I haven't seen The Little Woods before. I haven't seen Lady Parts before. Yeah. These are different things, and surely that's what everybody should be wanting, right? It's just yeah. new stuff, right? Yeah. You want to <laughs> see new stuff, right? The thing is, though, like as someone who just went through a lot of testing, People will tell you they want the same thing, but that's because we only are just regurgitating what we see. Because like if I get something, like even if I'm giving notes on something, the best note I can give is the one you got, which is like make it more you, make it crazier. I don't know how, because I'm not you, but like be inside your mind, give me more of what's in there. But like I also could say like, what if you did something like this? And it's literally something I've seen like in a Scorsese movie, you know what I mean? So it's, it's an interesting thing where we don't know what we want. so as filmmakers or producers, let's say, they don't know what the audience wants either. I think they just don't admit to that. Like, we have no idea what we want to see. We just want to see something new, but what is that? I don't know, it has to be new. Like, it's, it's a conundrum. <laughs> but, but that's what's exciting about making films. Yeah. But you mentioned Scorsese there, and I know that he was a, like, a hero of yours kind of growing up, and I think, you, have you met him? We um, we made intense eye contact. Oh I worked on a show of his. I have not met him officially. Okay. This is a funny thing that I think I talked about in, in an interview once, and, and now it's all of a sudden page. it's like he mentored me. He birthed me from my mother. Like he brought me. It's like no. Like I made too much noise one day, and he was like, so that is <laughs> that counts. <laughs> you know that counts. But what I will say is, you know, I went through a, a year of peeing on um, a bunch of pilots. The first was directed by Scorsese. The second by Steve McQueen and the third by wow. Steven Soderbergh. Wow. And so like I was a PA so it wasn't like they were like asking me my opinion but I was able to like watch them work and understand how much a director does to like set the tone not even intentionally but all the all the dysfunction all the respect all the great days all the bad days really comes from the top so I really learned that which is a valuable lesson and then I also learned like you can do it any which way. There's no set way to be be a director. So, um, so I learned a lot from those people. But I wasn't like, I mean, Steve McQueen was the one I talked to the most because he's just like a really chill human. He's, he's a lovely man. He's yeah. a lovely man. Yeah. yeah. How about you? I mean, do you? Who are your kind of mentors? Like, or not mentors, but like, who are your kind of 
who do you admire? Who do you look to? Who do you think they are doing it right? You know, um, you know, I feel very lucky. I, I had a lot of producers actually who kind of helped me through and guided me in in kind of how to to actually forge a path in the industry more than directors per se. Um, yeah, I, I and I'll, actually, you know, I, my my first jobs were on like really really low budget action movies, um, and there's like a, a Welsh director, Mark Price, and I was like running on his film, but also boom up because it was like, you know, it, seeing an action movie get made sort of demystified it for me because I thought action wasn't for for the like, stories I wanted to tell. And I think I was really lucky that the first jobs I was as a runner, I was like on something really low budget and just seeing how action was put together and being like, oh, actually I could do this and have it sort of center a South Asian family. Yeah. So I'd say like, yeah, those, those kind of early formative sort of yeah, running and, and as you say, like being an assistant. You know, I was also an assistant to a director who was awful, who I won't name. And you know, seeing bad directing is also really helpful when you see someone do it wrong and you're like, this is, and like you say, like the way it, it sort of filters down into the crew and just feeling the cast be miserable. And like, it, it also really is a, a lesson to learn when seeing it done the way you don't want to do it, mm. I'd say. Yeah, it, it can be very valuable that way, yeah. just, yeah, and I think any any sphere. Um, you, you both worked in TV as well, so I don't know if, you know, both of you actually in UK TV, right? You've, you've worked over here. Um, do you see a lot of difference, first of all, between the UK and the US in that, in that respect? Um, well, I, I guess you were sure running, basically, right? Because that was your, all yours. You wrote and directed the whole thing. Which is amazing, yeah. So that's the biggest, like the hugest difference. I mean, although it's happening a bit more in the States, it's like, rarely would someone write and direct an entire show. Also, there are no showrunners. There are not as many showrunners in the UK, which is like so stressful as an American. Um, but I, I only directed, I directed two episodes of Top Boy, and um, which was really, really fun. And um, I've never directed TV in the US because no one would let me at that stage. So I'm very grateful <laughs> to them for letting me do Top Boy. But, um, that was the kind of the biggest thing. Oh, and I also guess I did industry too. I was in the writers' room for industry, and there was no showrunner, um, and so that that's just like slightly weird to me. But, um, but yeah. But a good experience, like. You, oh, great! Yeah. Sorry, okay. both good experiences, okay, yeah, but yeah. just different. No, no pressure. Yeah. Like, yeah, you yeah, couldn't no, say they were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and, and how much did like the TV help? I mean, I guess a lot in your case. Yeah, right? yeah. so much. Um, so many of the heads of department or my team who I worked with on the TV show, I sort of brought with me pretty much, yeah, like almost everyone bar a couple of heads of department. So it was like, felt like it was a really cool, cool way to like step up with all the people I trusted and the team I knew, and that includes working title. Um, you know, I, they were the producers on the show and they had the, the kind of the continuity of that. So I felt actually stepping from making a TV show to a film didn't, there was just so many people I'd, I saw on the TV show there again. So it, there was like a nice continuity. I think that the difference was in the, the testing, the audience testing, the edit, the post-production of, of the film was like much longer. We had to do a lot of audience testing, go to the US, test it there, get all this, respond to a lot of audience feedback, um, which initially was highly traumatic. Mm -hmm. And I like had a breakdown because it was like mad. It's like being live trolled by an audience because then like afterwards they like get to get, they get people together and like tell the you why you group, suck. Yeah, group, yeah. It's insane. Um, but then, then I learned to use it. Then I learned to like actually see the benefit of it and like hearing it with an audience where it's like not quite working, where I could improve it. And I feel like it, the film, the film got worse when I freaked out, but then it got better when I like found what I, who I was again, eventually, you know? Um, but yeah, there was that element. But actually the data, you know, you get, they, you get percentages and who, who's your favorite character, who's your least favorite character, what's your favorite scene, what's your least favorite scene, who, when was it boring, when did you love it, what did you hate? No. Don't ask that. Um, what well, can I just say, yeah. like, about testing? It's like, mm. if you ask anyone, like, right after they watch a movie how they feel about it, it's gonna change like in a day, in an hour, after talking to their friends, mm. after, you know what I mean? Like, it just feels so, and there's so many amazing films that like mm. tested really shit. Yeah. And there's so many films that tested like in the high 90s, which is like super crazy high for a movie. Mm. The average I think is industry average is like a 67 or a 70. Mm. 
you know, there's a lot, I agree, like, what you hear in the focus groups are helpful, because you're like, okay, why are they seeing that? Why yeah. are so many people seeing this thing? But overall, like, it kind of feeds into the whole, like, show them what they already saw sort of thing. It's mm. like, that's, it's like a, it's hard as a director to, like, know what to take and what to leave. So I'm not surprised that that's you were, really like, yeah. had to adjust, because I had, I had the same thing. Yeah, it took me a while to digest the feedback, and also to, like, I liked hearing it. You know, and rather than hearing what people said, it was like feeling them watching it and observing or, and then seeing that was like the most valuable thing, I think. But then also then you can use the data against your execs. That's fun. When they're like, mm, these characters are boring. I'm like, well, I think you'll find they scored 70. When they scored 90, they're very popular. So it's like fun when that happens. And I'm like, oh, well, I think you'll find the data says you suck. That's always nice. Does it feel more personal because you both write and direct? Does it feel more... Like, oh my God, they're attacking me as a human being at that point. You know, I, I'm pretty like, uh, I kind of just like disassociate in those m moments. That's healthy. My, <laughs> yeah, my biggest fear with that is not like what the audience is gonna say, it's what the execs are gonna make me do to the movie based on what they've said. Um, because like I'm like I you know on my indie film I also I didn't have test screenings but I'd have like you know like 30 40 people that I knew and trusted and thought were smart come watch the film and you know ask questions and that are, you know do all that stuff um, but yeah no it's I'm it's it's just like how it's used as a tool is where I, I start to get mm. annoyed yeah <laughs> I find just like not saying anything is the best way to maintain sanity <laughs> and then sit with it later and just be like idiots and then yeah. be like damn they maybe they're right you know like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. has there been anything that's come out of that process which later you were like oh damn that was right yeah everybody else was right no <laughs> i don't i can't imagine that happening no, no. absolutely not those are very director's answers i like that that's good <laughs> um so what have been the most important lessons that you've learned so far what, what do you think is like absolutely like golden rule you're going to do all the time from now on? Genuinely, again, this might be a very director answer, but the, I think the hardest thing when you're starting out is trusting your instincts. Um, because I think your instincts as an artist or as a creator or as someone who has any job is what actually makes you good at it. And I think when you're starting out, you have so much self-doubt because you haven't done it before. You have to lead a crew, you have to do all this stuff. And my experience has been, if I, sh like, I, I don't want to leave feeling like, oh, I should have followed my instincts more. And I felt that way on pretty much everything, but it's less and less on each in each project. And sometimes I don't have like the control. Like I just did a Marvel movie. It's like not. It's not my. It's a Kevin Feige production. You know, it's his movie, um, which I went into kind of with open eyes about that. But I think when I'm doing my own thing, it's like okay, how, follow my instincts more, and I learn how to follow them better. If that makes sense too. So that's what I kind of learn each each movie. Yeah, I I'd say like I. I hire good people and then I trust them. Um, and that's my kind of MO of, because it's so big and it's such a collabor collaborative process filmmaking that it's, and, I, and I'm doing it more with series two of Lady Parts is like really trusting my team and like leaning on them more. Um, and really, whereas I felt with series one, you know, I wrote it all, I directed it all, I was like kind of insane. And because I was like, it needs to be great and I can do, but then you realize that how much everyone else's creativity just makes it way better. Like not even like, it's like way better. So it's sort of leaning in those ways. Like I was just writing the music for series two with my siblings again. And I sort of, I came with the concepts fully formed for series one and for series two, I'm like, guys, let's, let's spitball. And it was so much better. I'm like, all these songs are better. And, and so it's like, you know, I get the most joy out of when I trust someone and then I like, really trust them and they bring something it's that's the most exciting part of the creative process and you know as a director you just have the vision and you sort of make and you just kind of guide the tone but actually when you really can empower your team it just makes the whole thing so much more joyful okay i have a couple of questions coming out of that first one is something that like literally 10 people when i said i was doing this wanted me to ask you which is when can they have season two uh, <laughs> first of all um, and, and then the second one, I want to ask you both, we're at Glastonbury, I have to ask you both about music, because I think you both use it really carefully, really strongly in your, in your film. So how, how important is that? How do, you, how do you start finding the right, the right thing? I mean, you, you obviously start 
in lady parts by writing it so that that's easier <laughs> yeah um uh, so yeah series two of lady parts is out next year early next year i think john produces here so yeah we're shooting in a few months um i love music i wanted to be a musician before i wanted to be a filmmaker but then it all went to shit because it's hard. <laughs> It's so hard. It's so hard, and it's but it's music is the best. I, you know, I I made I created the whole show Lady Parts so I could write music with my siblings, um, and as you saw in Polite Society, my my brother scored it. He and I love working with him, and and I love you know with my editor working. He's got really great music taste and finding interesting music and you know like there's some songs in there that I found in like a record shop like this like old Ital uh, Japanese blues song and I really want it in there. I don't know, music for me, it's like almost, it's up there with like visuals as like sound and sound design. I'm a nerd about it and I love it. And so, yeah, it's the best. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm sort of the opposite. I love music, but I'm one of those people who like listens to the same thing for ages. And because I don't listen to the radio, I'm not on Spotify. Like I buy all the music that I like that I listen to. So are you like a vinyl person? I yeah, but not. I'm not like I don't have like a huge collection, but like I'll, I'll try to get like vinyl. Um, so when I think about music and film, like sometimes I think about needle drops, but mostly I think about how I'm going to make this score really visceral, really subjective, um, especially in a horror film. Um, you know, when it, with Candyman, I was really. I really wanted it to be weird, and I really wanted it to be in relationship to um, Philip Glass's score for the original film, which was so insane for a horror film. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, and even he was like, "I don't like that it's for a, this horror film. It's tacky." You know, he like didn't like Candyman at first. He was like upset about it, and I think he's come around since. But it's amazing, first of all, that Philip Glass even did a score for a horror film. Um, and so I was like, I don't want to copy that, but there are certain things I want to be inside of in terms of process and. Um, and so I work with Robert and I'm working with Hilder and it's like there's a similar thing with like voice and breath and like that's something I'm really interested in in score. So I just love to explore sound in, in different ways and, and music in different ways um, in order to create something like visceral and subjective. So that's sort of more where I come come to it. Yeah, just from. just the, the pure mood of the piece. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have to say I, I, I rewatched Candyman the other day mm -hmm. and that it has the, the creepiest credits, at both opening and closing, oh, yes. I feel like, so, yeah. of, of nearly anything I can think of. Like, <laughs> just, it really unsettling, oh, deeply, so deeply yeah. wrong. So I thank you for that, I Oh, guess. thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad. I really, like, the opening credits, I was like, because we were, initially in the script, it was like, basically, because in the original Candyman, they did, like, I think the first real drone shot uh, in a film. And so in the script, it was like, you know, another drone. And I was like, guys, no one cares about drone shots. Like, everyone has a drone now. So, like, how can we, like, flip this on its head? And I was like, oh, I guess we could literally flip it on its head. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was really fun to do. That's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Have, I, have I got any questions out there? I have been, oh, I do. Yeah, OK. Um, what I wanted to ask is, what's the biggest impact? Or what movie had the biggest impact on your lives? No pressure. Shit. Have you instantly forgotten every movie ever made? No, well, our movies. I have one. I think. Well, I, I saw. Um, I was a latchkey kid. My parents got divorced when I was nine, and raised by a single mom. So in the summer, I was just at home watching HBO, and watching a lot of inappropriate films for a nine-year-old. But I saw Dark Day Afternoon, um, and Full Metal Jacket, and American Beauty, and those three films really. I didn't know what the hell was happening. But something about them made me keep wanting to watch them. And I was like, I guess what my brain was doing was learning film, like learning film grammar. And so that was the beginning of me taking my love of like writing and storytelling and kind of imagining it in a film world. So that was, those are mine. Oh, those are pretty, pretty amazing those visual are great films movies. to start with. Wow. Yeah, but distressing for a nine year old. Yeah, but yeah, that. they're really, visually they're setting. And, yeah. Nine year old. Uh, when I was seven, I watched this film called Harriet the Spy which is about a girl who's a spy and she has a notebook and I don't know, and I felt really cool. It's so good. It's so good. When they do the tattoos, they like the tattoos oh, and put them on. Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> but I remember feeling cool and wanting a laptop. Um, I don't know, but it was just like a, an empowered young girl and I remember just what it made me feel. I felt like seen and I felt like me in the world was a good vibe. Um, and I think, I, somebody said that 
polite society reminded them of Pirate the Spy and I honestly almost cried. You know, like I haven't thought about that film since I was like literally seven. And then I was like, oh, that's my number one film. It's not the Coen brothers, it's Pirate the Spy. That's it's like that shot of your, uh, of your lead, like in the window staring at <laughs> yeah. the zoom in. I'm like, that feels right here in the spot. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, we have somebody here. Hi. Um, obviously, this panel is called uh, kind of How to Save Cinema. And when I look at what's happened lately with, I think, cinema has had some financial trouble. You look at a load of um, cinemas expressing concerns about the impact of Netflix and streaming giants and how that really puts kind of mainstream sitting down in the cinema, enjoying the experience at risk. Um, just want to get your thoughts on this, but in my opinion, one way to really in, kind of tap into that audience is through, and I'm grateful to Pilsen Palais for putting on um, polite society with captions, but do you think that more accessible performances is a great way to encourage more audiences to go into the cinema? Because Netflix managed to do it just fine. Loads of other online platforms managed to do it just fine. But what is really quite lacking is that sort, same commitment to accessibility from physical in-person cinemas. So I just would love to get your thoughts on that. Like open, you. open captions and like audio describe and that, that's, oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, um, especially when a movie is about, say it has the characters who are deaf or, or, or nonverbal or, or whatever, like it is absolutely shocking that that's just not a standard. Like every movie and every theater doesn't have at least a screening a day where you can do that. Um, I think that's a huge part of, of making that accessible because the experience of watching something on the big screen or hearing something in, in a big room is not um, just for people who can hear and see. I was thinking about how to save cinema and, you know, when, when, polite, so thank you. when polite Society came out, you know, it was like we were hoping it would do certain kind of numbers, but, you know, Guardians comes out and then it's, it's kind of, kind of goes away. No shade to Marvel. I love that film. So I know I'm gonna look at it. I, I haven't even seen it yet, but it's fine. <laughs> you know, but so my dream was that we, it would have like a, a proper cinema life and like, you know, we make, make filmmakers, we are filmmakers who want to see things in the cinema and we want to see it, you know, we want everyone to come and see it and share it together. It, that's like, you know, it's characters we don't get to see. So you want it to be as inclusive as possible, but you know, ticket prices are getting more expensive and people are kind of finding streaming more, accessible and it's sort of something as a filmmaker I'm also like sort of come, trying to come to terms with like it's okay now the film's online even though I was like no but I wanted it to be in cinemas and I wanted everyone to get to see it together in the cinema but actually most people will probably watch it um, and stream it um, and, and that's okay. Um, it feels to me as an observer as a journalist that part of the problem is the the studios because they are run by businessmen rather than mm. film businessmen, if that makes a sense. Like, they were never run by filmmakers really for long, but they were, they were run by people who cared about film. And now they're run by people I think who mostly care about money. Yeah. Um, and, and I would honestly, exp like uh, somebody like Kevin Feige, he, he loves movies, yeah, yeah. but at the same time, he's, his boss cares about money. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that what we're having is a situation where studios don't want to take risks and they think that they can avoid taking risks and that's kind of what I was getting at before I feel like yeah. and please disagree with me if you do the only risky thing is not taking risks and the yeah. only risky thing is doing the same old nonsense because I feel like people are being trained out of going to the cinema honestly yeah, yeah. but I'm anyway, sorry please no I agree I, but I also think there's always been this thing with art and commerce it's like movies cost money like they have to like movies uh, a studio has to turn a profit to stay alive um, but I also think we used to be in a space where it was like not every movie needed to make money. We had our tent poles that would then enable us to make these smaller films that could be daring and interesting um, and maybe not make money but be important and be discovered later down, down the road and, um, and, and not have to make like, uh, you know, all of its money back in the first two weekends that it's out, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's a huge, huge aspect of it as well. Yeah. I it's an interesting one because I I'm at a, a point I'm I'm at a bit of a transitional phase. I don't really know what to do next. In that, the film that I thought I wanted to do next, I realized might get me in director jail. In that, like if it costs too much but doesn't have any famouses in and isn't gonna be a business vibe, then I may not get. To, so I'm just like okay. 
you know, it's weird. It's not, it's not cool to have to think about the, the business side of it. And I feel like naturally my, my inclination as a filmmaker is fairly like, it, it's not as art house, like I, it can play mainstream. So I feel like, okay, cool. I can just trust what I like and that might be enough. But actually I don't think it's enough because you know, when a producer's like, do you, you do you, listen, you got critical, great, polite, but keep doing you, but just put someone really, really famous in it. And I was like, mm, there's not much diversity among famouses. Um, and then they were like, eh. so eh, I don't know what I'm also, saying. I feel is, like that's kind of a fallacy. Like not a lot of, there aren't really a super, like actor superstars anymore that will absolutely guarantee a box office. True. Right? So it's also just like, again, like an old school comfortability that hasn't really evolved. Hello, um, I was a huge fan of Ms. Marvel last year, and I was just wondering uh, to Nia what it's like to work with Iman Vellani, because she's so new to the industry. Um, I've said this to everyone, she's my absolute favorite. Um, she's the best, she's so wonderful, she really has her head on straight, like she's just the, she's so, she's so professional, like, and she's fun, she's so sweet, and she's cool, like, she's my favorite, um, I love her so much. My question was, because you mentioned Martin Scorsese earlier, um, and comments have been made about Marvel and how you know, it's killing cinema. I mean, I don't know if I agree, but you know, it's been said. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on that specifically, and how do you sort of reconcile like, one of your idols sort of saying something like that, because obviously now you're a part of the Marvel machine, as it were. Mm. But yeah, that's my question, thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not surprised by his opinion on Marvel films, and like, I don't. I thought. I, mean, I thought. I thought he was really funny. I got, <laughs> like, there's actually a really good meme that's like, who's the best Marvel villain? It's like Thanos, Loki, Martin Scorsese. <laughs> like, I'm here for that content, so I, <laughs> I have no issues with what he has to say, and I think like, you know, you know, he made. He's been making movies since like the '70s, and in that time, and that's a movie. That's a period in filmmaking that I'm super inspired by. Probably the most inspired by. And also, as a 12-year-old, when I saw Spider-Man in theaters for the first time, I was like, holy shit, what the hell? Like, and so like, filmmakers in the 70s made me feel like, oh shit, you can do anything in cinema. You can tell the craziest stories. You can do Dark Day Afternoon. You can do um, The Deer Hunter. And then watching Spider-Man, I was like, oh my god, this guy got bit by a spider. I can do that too? So I, I've always been someone as a lover of film who wants to be in all the genres. Um, from, a, from a point of view, though, of like, preserving film and films that aren't all superhero or big action or fast and furious. It's like you were just speaking about like Guardians came in and like polite society went away. Like so and that's that's a shame. So I think like I absolutely understand where he's coming from. Um, my own personal experience is I love him so much and I also like Spider-Man. Um, it's interesting that Helen mentioned about studio execs being more about the money than the actual content of the film. Um, I think it's kind of exemplified in Disney's constant slew of remakes of, this seems to be announced every single week now. Um, and there are remakes which are genuinely brilliant, Candyman. Um, but I want to know how the panel feels about original stories maybe not being prioritized by the big players. I feel sad about it, you know. Similarly, you know, I was excited about cinema in the 80s, John Carpenter movies, you know, we were like, oh, original, you know. I'm always like, you know, IP was once an original idea, you know? And I was like, how do you have any IP? I'm like, that's all just old originals. Like, I can give you a new original, you know? And it's, because when people take away the writing element or the kind of, the creating the idea element, that's so sad, because that's my favorite part of it. Um, and, and it is now a case of like, uh, you, you know, it's getting stuff through, which is genre, and, and I should be so grateful, and I am so grateful. Um, but it's sort of like, do you want to do this thingy? I'm like, mm. and then you try and like get your vibe in and I'm just like, could I be me? And then I try and, and then I realize the thing I want to make is, is so away from the thing that it was that it will just piss off the people who actually like the thing. Mm -hmm. And then you end up saying no. And then your agents are like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I feel you. Um, yeah, I think it's again, it's another thing where it's like, like studios want to say like a short bet with like IP, mm. but like how many movies trailers have you seen for movies that like are based on books and you're like, who cares? 
it, like <laughs> it being based on a book or a podcast or a video game does not mean it's going to make a good movie. Um, especially video games, my God. Um, it's like, I was like talking to an exec about like what makes a good video game movie. And I was like, it's if the story of the video game is amazing. Like I love Left 4 Dead, but there's no story. So like, I'm not gonna make a Left 4 Dead movie cause it's just gonna be them going from the mall to the helicopter that's inexplicably on top of a building. <laughs> like, so I'm just like, there was this, this fallacy that IP will like save us and make us money, but actually it's, it's original stories. It's like getting the audience excited. So it's saying you can only see this in theaters actually. And it's something you've never seen before. Yeah, I actually had a meeting where like, I was pitching an idea and it was an original one. They're like, oh, you should make that a comic so then you can have IP. I'm like, yes. what? This has <laughs> happened to me that? too. It was, make it a podcast and we can make an IP. Yeah. And then it's like, I don't understand. So you want me. Yeah. It's, it's bonkers. It's, it's like, if there's something that's pre made and it's made, and then oh, it's just like. Uh. Yes. The, I listen to top 10 sort of cinema podcasts on. Uh, the UK cinema, and like almost every week there will be a Bollywood film in there. And the critic will go, oh, well, it wasn't press screen, so I haven't seen it, I don't know anything about it. And it seems to speak to a like general lack of interest in uh, the greater public of what is almost definitely like a very big, like in the UK, South Asian interest in films. Um, and you know, from my perspective, uh, Parasite and The Mood for Love, um, I had a third one that's completely gone from my mind. Um, the Raid, um, international features which, you know, are revealed through, like, really seeking them out in the UK at least, because there seems to be a lack of interest in foreign language films. I'm wondering if there are, uh, from you two guys, any people coming up, directors, um, editors, and photographers, uh, who aren't Western, who you have a particular eye on at the minute, who you think is going to be, you know, as big as you are now? As big as you are. <laughs> who are Mm. I mean, the name it's escapes me, but um, I don't know if you guys seen the film Joyland. It's just a Pakistani film. I Have loved, you seen it? Loved. His, he's, it's a brilliant piece of filmmaking. It's exciting. Um, I'm also a big fan of, I mean, he's British, but he's sort of Pakistani. Um, Aleem Khan, who made the film After Love, which Joanna Scanlon won. It was really great. Um, yeah, there's two, two that come to mind. Maybe? Yeah. Um. Um, oh, this is terrible, but um, oh, this show's not even out. I just I saw this amazing Korean. Basically, when I was, I went to NYU, I went to film school. When everyone was watching like French New Wave, I was like really into Korean cinema, and so I was like really into like Kim Ki Duk and Park Chan Wook and all these amazing filmmakers. And um, and then I got really into Korean dramas, which is a very different energy. Um, but my agent sent me this like amazing Korean TV show that is based on a short film that was all one shot, but that's not even what's most interesting about it. It's just the way it like twists and turns. I cannot remember the director's name or the writer's name. Oh man, I'm so upset at myself right now. But but I will say overall, like as a place where I go to look at look at and look for interesting cinema, like Korea is definitely a place that I, I find really exciting um, and has been for a long time. Um, yeah. Some astonishing films come out there. I'm really sorry we have to wrap it up because in about 10 minutes, uh, Candyman is going to be on f on screen. So brace yourselves now. Um, but thank you so much, Nita Manzer and Nia Costa. Thank you all for your questions. Thanks. Yeah.